Amen. Friday night, uh, the Lord just dropped something in my heart. It's not anything new. It's not new to me. It won't be new to you. But try as I may to kind of steer in a different direction, I found myself yesterday two or three times coming back to this same theme. And so I'm just going to be obedient to the Lord today. Yes. Amen. So I feel that the Lord, he knows who's going to be in every service. I don't have any way of knowing that. And uh, I'll just say this as a disclaimer, not for this message, but for any message. I don't wait till I get to church to pick, pick my sermon. <laughs> I don't choose my message from the crowd. And uh, so I want you to turn with me in the book of Luke chapter 4. And I just mentioned this scripture a few services ago. But Luke chapter 4 and verse number 16, and we'll read just a, a little bit here this morning. The Bible says in Luke 4 and 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. This is talking about Jesus. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave again to the minister and sat down and in the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Amen. Well, it's a very familiar passage for some. And uh, I just ask the Lord to touch us today. And again, you can be seated if you would like. I believe that perhaps one of the greatest challenges that any generation has ever faced is to reach that generation with the saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not sure that our challenge is any greater today than any challenge of any other generation because in our own respective rights, we have all had our own battles to face, hills to climb, seasons of culture that we've had to deal with. But the book of Acts chapter 13 and verse 36 is a passage of scripture that perhaps in its own way is a passage that challenges me differently, perhaps greater than any other passage in scripture because Acts 16 and 36 says that, gener that talking about David, that David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep or passed and was laid with his fathers. But all of this happened after he served his own generation. And so for many years now, even years have turned to decades now, that passage of scripture has served as a benchmark for me as an individual and certain, certainly for me as a pastor and for us as a church to realize that God is calling on us to serve our generation. Now, I know that it seems like it's a crazy hour in which we're living, but I believe that others before us thought they were living in a crazy hour as well because they were. They were. But God has called you and I and he never called for this day and he never calls us without equipping us. And so we can't look at the dark backdrop of all that's going on in our world socially and politically and every other way and think how in the world can we be expected to do this and not understand in the same breath and by the same token just as God anointed Daniel to stand at a lion's den and just as God allowed three Hebrew children, boys, men to stand in the face of a fiery furnace and Jonah to go to Nineveh and the list could go on and on and on and on. God, by the same measure, is looking to us to serve this generation. And so that's what I want to talk about today is serving this generation. I believe that, that as David served his generation that we too can understand that God is 
expecting, demanding, commanding, if you please, us to serve our generation. Uh, I know that we are and have been in uncharted waters for some time. I don't like to give a lot of credence to that. It's not because I'm in denial of it, but I think we've all heard enough about it. And we've all heard all we want to hear about it. But it is, nevertheless, it's an irrevocable truth that we've had to learn how to navigate, and it has changed. I remember um, well uh, during 9-11 and how people were talking about how 9-11, even as it happened, the day that it happened, that this would be a game changer. It would change our world. And in truth, it did. It forever, it left a forever mark on our world. I, I don't think that it left just a, a completely negative mark on our world. It changed many things for the good. It changed many things for the good. I know that air travel is a little bit more difficult today, but I'll tell you what, I sure feel a lot safer. Amen? Well, you may not, but I feel, <laughs> I don't mind standing in that, in, that, in that line. I feel a little bit safer knowing that we've kind of all had a little bit more scrutiny and it. it we, we may get to our destination now and, and things of that nature. So it hasn't changed everything for the negative. And I believe that some of the things that we've encountered in recent years, it has changed our world and it has probably changed it forever, but it all hasn't been a negative thing, a negative change. I believe that we can realize that God is using various methods to help us to reach this generation, help us to serve this generation. I know that some of this is old hat, and we've talked about it many times, but, but when the pandemic closed churches for the most part, we thought at least closed, it closed in-service worship services. The gospel was spread like a fire as it went online and who could have anticipated the, the amount and it was very difficult especially for a few shoulders that a lot of that fell on a lot of responsibility on our leaders and things of that nature but the gospel not just in our church but all across the nation and all around the world the church was forced out of its four walls overnight woefully, woefully uncomfortable for many that began that but as we begin to see what the Lord could actually do and then receive positive responses from even through our church from all across the country of how people were being moved and impacted by the word of God and so I say Lord thank you for helping us serve this generation because in truth the church has been blessed with access to some of the greatest tools that we have ever known to help us adequately reach our generation with intention. However, the church, I believe, must understand a few things. I believe that one of the things that we must understand is that every service matters. Every service counts. I'm not referring to just regularly scheduled services but I think for a local church, every service that, is, that we plan is a, is a moment that should matter to us. Not that we just kind of come in casually and think, well, que sera, sera, whatever will be. But I believe that we must prayerfully consider that service. We must prayerfully consider every aspect of that. Why? Because we have no idea what's going to walk through the door and the mandate remains serve this generation. We have just closed a very, very busy summer schedule of camps in our district. In June, we began with children's ministry camps, two of them, and then it followed that by two youth camps. And in, in July, we had our family camp, and then the week after family camp, we had our third and final youth ministry camp, teen camp. And then this week, we had our Spanish ministries camp, that was Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And so over the course of the last few weeks, we have seen many, many people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and lives changed. I'm, I'm not talking about maybe so or maybe or might have been Friday night. My wife and I were privileged to be in a service where almost 2,000 of Spanish constituents across our district were in service on Friday night. Amen. The platform was full to overflowing during the altar service with young people and young couples receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 194 people received the Holy Ghost Friday night in Ocala. Amen, I'm telling you that we're being called on to serve 
this generation. Amen. I'm glad that we had more than just a chicken dinner to offer them. I'm glad that we had more than just a little pamphlet to hand them. I'm glad that somebody said, we've got to take this serious. I, I, forgive me for not having all the numbers of our children's ministry camps and youth camps, but I'm telling you that many of our young people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Many of them for the very first time, some received a renewing in the Lord, and that's important because I believe the weight and the responsibility of the church, not only of today, but certainly of tomorrow, is already resting on the shoulders of some of these young people. And so every function that we have, it should be designed to minister to the needs of the people that God sends our way. Amen. So we got to find what fits. To do this, we've got to understand the time and that we must not be doing something just for the sake of doing it because if we're not careful, I believe if we're not really very careful that we can just allow the church services and the church functions and the ministry of the local church to just be about us and just kind of meet my need and satisfy where I am and it needs to be my favorite preacher, my favorite sermon, my favorite theme. It needs to be my favorite song, my favorite tempo. Amen. I pray that the Lord will help us to never bow to the altar of me, bow to the altar of this being about just us. Now, I realize that we often come to church burdened with all manner of problems and just because you have the Holy Ghost and just because you've been baptized in his name doesn't mean that everything is well. Doesn't mean that every that you have no issues in your heart or in your life. Amen. But I tell you today that we need to come in and say, Lord, help me to realize the value of ministering to others. I want to say something here that many of you can relate to, that many times in ministering to others, God will minister to you. That while you're trying to help somebody else, before you know it, God has already put something in your heart and you're strengthened. Amen. You're encouraged. You may even be physically healed or spiritually healed in the process of helping somebody else. I believe that as a church, we need to be spiritually planted by the river of God's sustaining power. I believe that the church must stay planted by the sustaining power of God's word. Amen. The Bible says, I want you to look with me, if you will, in Genesis 49, 22. Here's what Jacob had to say about Joseph in the book of Genesis. The Bible says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. Now this one scripture, this one passage of scripture underlines three points. Those three points are this. Number one, Joseph is a fruitful bough. There is something that's on there. There's fruit he is putting forth. It is a fruitful bough. The second point, it is a fruitful bough that is planted by a well. That is important to understand. And then third, it says whose branches ran up and over the wall. I believe that that ought to be a snapshot of the church. Amen. The church that is planted by the well. Not a branch withering on the vine. Not a branch just hoping to get a little bit of something for myself. Amen. Not a branch that's always in need. But I believe the church ought to be a healthy, fruitful bough that is reaching up over the wall. Amen. It said of Joseph that he was a bough. Amen. A bough planted, a fruitful bough. A fruitful bough planted by the well and a bough that was reaching up and over. Are you hearing me? Reaching up and over the wall. I believe the church ought to be reaching up and beyond just these walls. Just beyond our family. Beyond me and my, beyond me and my friends. Hallelujah. That ought to be the picture of a church. I mean, I believe that we ought to feel an obligation, a pressing obligation to have services and functions that are planned with the idea we're gonna figure out how to reach over the wall right here. We're gonna reach, figure out how we can reach into another life, another home, another heart, another family, not here and there, not every now and then, but every time we come together, let there be something that is so obvious that we're centered about shooting the gospel beyond where we stand today. Amen. And so that certainly doesn't mean that every service is going to look or sound the same. 
But regardless of the tempo of the service, regardless of what it may be, I believe there ought to be a reaching and there ought to be a stretching mindset. That bow, fruitful bow planted by the wall, this growing up the wall, that's reaching over the wall. Hallelujah. And so if the service is fast, it ought to be reaching. If the service is slow, it ought to still be reaching. Hallelujah. If it's a fiery sermon that stirs us from our pew, it ought to cause us to reach. If it's just a teaching, amen, where we're sitting down and listening to the word of God and listening listening and concerning, considering his word, applying it to our heart, there still ought to be a reaching over the wall. Praise God. Praise God. You know, some people get a snapshot of what they think church should be or should, should be or, or should uh, be to them at least, I would say. And so anything that falls short of that was, well, Amen. I'm just going to ask you to start leaving your clipboards in the foyer. Leave your clipboard in the foyer. Amen. Let's just have church and say, Lord, let there be some reaching that's going on in this teaching. Let there be some reaching that's going on in this preaching. Let there be some reaching that's going on in this singing. Let there be some reaching that's going on in this prayer. There needs to be a reaching and a stretching mindset. We're not coming here so everything can be tailored to our particular need, but there must be a clear understanding of our text. Preaching the gospel to the poor, healing the brokenhearted, deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to blind, liberty to them that are bruised. Amen. And we cannot afford to allow ourselves to lose sight of this because this is our calling. Additionally, I mentioned a moment ago, we've got to find what fits. In other words, there we have to find what is relevant, and I know that's a word that almost gets abused today, but I still think it's I, th- I, th- I think it's fitting that we got to find what fits this generation. There was a time uh, many years ago where a person could probably get on the well. I'm sure they could. I remember them barely, but I can remember them as a child. Somebody you know they call them street preachers. Just get on the street corner and just start preaching and. A crowd would gather up and and, uh, and the spirit of the Lord began to move and God did many wonderful things right on the street corner. Somebody didn't have a Hammond organ, didn't have a choir singing in the background, but that's not effective today. You, you, it's probably not even legal in most places to do things of that, nation, or of that nature. But So for one generation, you could reach somebody with that approach, but that's not something that would work today. And so it's incumbent upon us that we stay fresh fresh with our day and facing uh, understanding that the battle or facing what we are looking at today and and the the ministry of of how to reach into the heart. I believe that part of the battle that we face as a church is to stay in front of the needs that we're faced with in this hour, to stay in front of that, ahead of that. Amen. People have lived for years looking for in all the wrong places for the answer to their life. Can we get an amen to that? There are many people that have lived years of their life looking in all the wrong places, trying to satisfy it with this and satisfy it with that. And as a result, as a result of that, they oftentimes are shattered and and their lives are torn into pieces. And when they come to God, it's like what the, the minor prophet said about the shepherd that found the two legs and a piece of an ear. That's all that was left of the of the sheep. But but it was enough that a shepherd picked it up and he said, I'm going to bring this home. The wolves are not going to destroy what's left and so many times people come in and their lives are just shattered and torn I don't want to look at them and say man you're bleeding too bad for us or that's too deep of a wound we don't know how to take care of that or man we've never faced a problem quite like this on this wise no no I say Lord whatever comes in the door help us to minister to this generation help us to reach them preach believe that God really is a restorer of broken things and that God really really he really will give back the years that the canker worm and the locusts have destroyed and so we've got to reach our world with a message of hope hallelujah again I, I'm not ignoring the needs of the legitimate needs certainly of any church family but if we aim everything at us then others we're going to do that at the expense of others ultimately And so it's easy to desire to do what we want and have what we want. But I want to challenge 
your hearts this morning with something here, perhaps, if nothing else, just food for thought. But we, we must be intentional in our, in our pace and in what we're doing and, and because if we fail to minister to those that God has placed in our care, then we will fail, ultimately. When, and, and um, so it was very fitting we had a baby dedication today, but these are not the only children here. But when a young couple starts having children, everything in their lives becomes a testimony to the fact that they have children. And you can just walk by their car, and everything in their car is a testament to the fact that they have children. Strollers and baby seats and toys and it's just there. They're just their home is marked. Sometimes their clothes are marked. <laughs> it's a testimony of the fact that they have children. Every move they make is centered around the fact that children are now involved. When you don't have children, my wife and I were married for five years before our son was born, and so we understood this, that when you don't have children, you just we could just be so whimsical. Just decide it. We had a little, what's it called, banana boat. We had a little place down the road from our house called the banana boat. It was a health food store. <laughs> And uh, we could just decide real late at night we wanted a hot fudge Sunday or a banana split. Man, it's three minutes later, we're there. That changed. And after a while, you're just decided it's not even worth the effort. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going, I'll have some Captain Crunch and go to bed. Change is how you live. Change is the pace of your life. I'm not implying that children are a bother or that they're an interruption. I don't mean that. They're worth anything that you would encounter and, and, uh, and, and all of the above. But there is a passage of scripture in Genesis 33, and I, I'm going to mention this in closing, but there's a passage in Genesis 33, and it's a passage that I've referred to a lot. But it underlines something that I want to leave you with today. Chapter 32, if I could just kind of go back to set the context of this scripture, is when Jacob is wrestling with the angel, and many people are familiar with that. He wrestled with the angel all night, the breaking of day. He leaves that encounter, and he's changed on many levels. His name has been changed. His hip is forever out of joint. He walks different. He is a changed man physically and spiritually. You also may remember that Jacob had um, been running from, away from his oldest brother, older brother Esau, for many years because earlier Jacob had deceived Esau out of his birthright and Esau was wanting to kill him and Jacob doesn't really know what's going to happen when they meet and they have, they've scheduled this meeting and Jacob has no idea what's fixing to shake down. And um, he's prepared for the worst. And so when we turn to Genesis 33, it opens with Jacob putting together this great offering to make amends to his brother. It's a beautiful story of reconciliation in the greatest sense. And they come together and he finds that Esau had really indeed forgiven him and their relationship was restored. And so then Esau says to Jacob, he said, I want you to join me on this journey. And... and uh, and, and we'll travel together. And so I'm not sure what all Esau was traveling with. I, it appears at least in, in part in some scripture that Esau was just traveling with men of war. But Jacob was traveling with children and animals. And so it just made sense that Esau could probably travel a little bit faster than Jacob could travel. So they set out on their way and then in chapter 33 verse 12 the Bible says and he said let us take our journey and let us go and I will go before thee and then Jacob said unto him he said my Lord knoweth that the children are tender 
and the flocks and the herds with young or with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. So he said, let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before the servant. And then listen to this. He says, Jacob says, I will lead on softly according as the cattle goeth before me and the children be able to endure. Such words of wisdom. I want to go where you're going. I want to be where you're going to be. I want us to be together. But Jacob said, I realize one thing, that I've got some young children and some animals with young, and if we overdrive them one day, they could all die. And if they die, we're gonna, if we lose our children, we're going to lose our future. And if we lose these animals, we'll lose our sacrifice. And so what I'm going to do is just dial things back. You go on. But I want to get there with what God entrusted me with. So if I could say this morning as a pastor and a shepherd that I want us to be intentional about what we're doing as a church because when we get there, I want them to be with us. It must make sense. It must make sense just for us to care for them and make sure that you're able to walk with us. So I don't want to launch and think that somebody that just received the Holy Ghost should know everything and overnight. Amen. We all have to grow and we have to learn about the ways of God and learn his ways. And amen, I just want you to survive, that's all. I just want you to make the journey. I want you to be there in the end. We don't want to overdrive one day. But that does not mean that we're not headed somewhere. It doesn't mean that we're not going somewhere. Amen. And so I pray that the Lord would help us to realize the value of that as a church. So as we stand, amen. So where we are in the book of Genesis really isn't much different at all from where we were reading earlier from the book of Acts because the Bible just simply says David served his generation. And so all throughout the word of God, we can find people serving their generation. And so I believe that it, the call of the 21st century church is no different than any other church. Yes, we do live in an hour where it seems that there is an unprecedented sense of brokenness. But the Lord has entrusted us with that task. So he said to his disciples, the first church, just go. Don't even take any raiment, don't take shoes, don't even worry about what to say. Just go. And I'll take care of it all. We find the Lord later also sending disciples, but he told them to take their clothes with them. Same message, just a different method. Amen. Same gospel, just a different approach. And so I tell us today that we can't change our message because this is what's going to get us to heaven. Amen. But I pray God help us. And so we have been very intentionally for many, many weeks now praying for our prodigals and we're gonna to continue to do that. I'm not suggesting that we've never done that before, but I'm praying God to send our prodigals home and I'm praying God send brand new people to walk through these church doors. Amen, I'm praying for our church family to be stirred into action, stirred into prayer, stirred into fasting, stirred into study in your own home, in your own, in your own world, in your own schedule. So Lord, stir us and shake us, move us. Amen. Praying for the spiritual womb of this church to be more fertile than it has ever been. Oh God, give us babes because we want to serve this generation. 
Amen, amen. For many, many weeks now, my wife has been, some of you ladies know this, if you don't, you're welcome to join her. Amen, my wife has been going through our Sunday school rooms and our children's ministry department every Sunday morning and praying in those rooms. Brother Fears has been doing that for years, but we've been praying, God, we want you to fill these classrooms to capacity. God, we want you to touch it with young people. We want you to touch their hearts and their lives. Why? Because we wanna serve our generation. Please don't just stand back and assess what's wrong, but join the battle and say, God, help us to get a hold of the altar. Help us, oh God, that we might be able to touch the lives of men and women everywhere. I feel the Holy Ghost stirring in this place. Amen, I believe that we ought to move. Amen, stirred by his spirit today. Amen, stirred by his spirit today. Touch us, amen, let the Lord touch us.